Broadcasting the information the mainstream media won't touch. This is The Richie Allen Show in association with DavidIke.com. A lot of you are very excited about our featured guest this hour. So am I. Uh, she's a former CIA officer and the author of the best-selling book, Extreme Prejudice is a terrifying story of the Patriot Act and the cover-ups of 9-11 and Iraq. It's an outstanding read. It really is. And it is available at all good online bookstores or, or booksellers or purveyors of books. She's terrific. Um, she forewarned the US government of the 9-11 attacks, the impending attacks uh, in, in, in DC at the Pentagon and in New York and elsewhere. Uh, she attempted to prevent the invasion of Iraq and really, it has to be said, the consequences of her actions for her and her family were pretty extreme. I recommend you get the book. It's a terrific and a fascinating story. All the more interesting, of course, because it's true. Uh, let's welcome to the programme, uh, all the way from Maryland, uh, Susan Linder. Susan, you're very welcome to the show. How are you? I am doing great, and I'm in a tremendously happy mood because we have just stopped, uh, a few days ago, we stopped Jeb Bush's campaign for president. And those of you in Britain, of course, know that Jeb Bush is the brother of George Bush, and they tried to make an empire in the United States, and we stopped them cold. And I'm proud to say that I helped. Uh, in my small way, I helped. You know what, um, Susan? Think, <laughs> when you mention him, of course, we think of him sending Catherine Harris to Texas uh, to pay a company to illegally remove uh, tens of thousands of African Americans from the voting rolls so that they couldn't vote in Florida in 2000. In one of the biggest scandals in US history, he had his dirty fingers in, in that scandal, didn't he, Jeb Bush? Oh yes, he did. He is he is he is a, a scumbag in his own right, and he is he's his his policies in Florida have wrecked education. He's been a terrible governor, but yes, he's he's been part of the voter suppression that has stopped African Americans from voting. Absolutely, he's very dangerous. But in in my case, I went I have been on doing lots of talk radio about Iraq and the Patriot Act and how Bush is to blame for all these things. Of course, you in the, in the in Britain and the international community, you see with distance. So you have more perspective and you recognize the the truth, the obvious truth <laughs> of what I'm saying to you. Yeah. But here in the United States, you would be amazed. There is still uh, a slavish devotion to the lies about 9-11, a slavish devotion to the lies of Iraqi pre-war intelligence. Um, the, for, for your listening audience's background, I was locked in prison on a military base on in, in Carswell Air Force Base in Texas for a year while George Bush and Colin Powell and Dick Cheney and all those big big shots, very big, powerful people swore that my that the intelligence community was to blame for the bad decision to go to war with Iraq. None of those people had the courage or integrity to shoulder the responsibility for what they had done to us and um, and it was all a blatant lie. We did know about 9-11. I, I gave advance warning in uh, August of, 19, of 2001, a month before the attack. I contacted the Office of Attorney General John Ashcroft and, at their insistence, the Office of Counterterrorism at the Justice Department. I had also had a double whammy because I um, provided advance um, – gave – Catastro- I, I, I predicted catastrophic consequences and I helped to negotiate the return of the weapons inspectors to Iraq because I was the chief asset covering the Iraqi embassy. So I sat down with Iraq's ambassador and senior diplomats and I over a period of like 18 months – this wasn't just a period of a few weeks. This was over like 18 a long months. Long time, long time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I negotiated the return of the weapons inspectors and pushed it through very hard. And uh, so my contribution – and then when when they said they wanted to have a war instead of the, the weapons inspectors, I was like, that's a disastrous move. And I went and told everybody how hard Iraq was trying to get the weapons inspectors in, which showed that by their behavior that they had nothing to hide. Um, so, well, so you know what, Susan? I, I it's became really, a threat. I became a threat. Let's put it that you way. You became a very serious threat. I'm, I'm, what, of course, is very interesting is, especially about the weapons of mass destruction, 
US officials knew exactly what Iraq did and didn't have because everything it had was sold to them by the United States um, to bomb the, right. to bomb its neighbour Iran into oblivion. So we, we knew exactly what they had. You know, the foreknowledge of the attacks and, 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 and your part, the part you played in telling people about that in August, um, we, we even suspect that... Um, Terrific by you to do to, to to you know to exercise due diligence and to do your job properly as you did. But we suspect that they knew well in advance of that that something was going to happen, something major uh, was coming up. You know the project for a new American century and all of that. We could be uh, we could be here all day. I got to ask you this, Susan. When you've been at the Iraqi embassy and the Iraqi officials based there, what was what was it like being around those people as it became increasingly obvious? that the United States was dragging Britain and other countries into what would become the disastrous, you know, Iraq war. How, how, how were they reacting to that? Throughout the, the build-up, the weapons inspections had started and Iraq immediately began to work consistently 24-7 to comply with those inspections. So the louder the United States and chomped at the bit for war and championed war, the more seriously, devotedly uh, committed the Iraqis became towards compliance. And they would run to I, – I was at the embassy, like you said. I was in New York at the embassy, and, and they were scurrying around – uh, racing from meetings to, to go to different embassies with different diplomats, showing Iraq's compliance, detailing all of their success. And, and the tragedy is we have forgotten this, but those weapons inspections were highly successful. And that was not an accident. We had gone through ev- exhaustively every single problem scenario, and we had made the Iraqis identify how they would do every single thing differently. And even though the first weapons inspections had really not the, – the problems had not been their fault, to be perfectly honest with you. This was – you know, the, the United Nations had been uh, bombastic, had been antagonistic and, and, and insulting and degrading to the Iraqi – Mental, the Iraqi people and their nationalism, but I said you can't. It doesn't matter. You, it doesn't matter that the consequence is going to be borne by you alone. So you have to change your behavior, and no matter what they do to you, you cannot. You cannot react. You have to be programmed to be positive. And I have to tell you, the greatest tragedy was how hard and and how hard and and consistently they worked to show that they would not be struck off that mark. They stayed to it to the very, 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 very end, complying at every turn, making sure and 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 running around the United Nations, taking their proofs of performance to yeah, all the yeah. different embassies. And and you know, it was just it was they there was such hope. And and that's also something that just breaks my heart when I re- – it's a good question you asked. There was such hope even when the United States was bombastic and threatening and saber-rattling and even when the deployments of the soldiers were going on. The logic and the common sense was if the Iraqis persevere in proving that the, there are no weapons of mass destruction, how can you justify an invasion? I understand and that, of course, Susan. you couldn't. I understand you couldn't that. You could justify it. It's terrible what yeah. happened. You know, thinking about you today and thinking about what might come up in, in the conversation, I was thinking that, you know, I, I could actually imagine, because when you're right and when right is on your side, as it was on the side of the Iraqis and the Iraqi people and people like you, you just naturally think and you assume no matter how corrupt everything is, this will eventually stop. People will, they will realise that, you know, this, this government doesn't have any weapons of mass destruction and it isn't using uh, weapons of mass destruction on its own people. I must ask you this, and um you know, I've known about you for a long time. It's kind of incredible. Our paths haven't crossed on radio or television, but I've known about you a long time, of course. And I'll ask you about that later on. What, 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 you know, what is it like when somebody like you is thrown into the public glare in the way that you were? But before that, what did you think, Susan, when you learned that um, weapons expert Dr. David Kelly was murdered in England after a conversation he had with uh, the BBC and Andrew Gilligan, where he basically told... Gilligan, that the British government's dossier 
on weapons was sexed up, that it was lies, basically, that the Iraqis didn't have anything. And you must have suspected when Kelly appeared before the Parliamentary Foreign Affairs Select Committee and was humiliated, and then only two days later, when he was found dead. Susan Lindauer, that must have worried you, because you were Dr. David Kelly. Oh, yes. Dr. David Kelly is a hero to all. He should have won the Nobel Peace Prize. He should have won. He he deserved so much more praise and gratitude from all of the anti-war community. He should be regarded as a martyr to this community. He is his his he, he spoke truth to power and he paid the most terrible price. I immediately knew it was a murder. I had no doubt. There was no question that he committed suicide because in your own heart, when you're speaking, when you know something and it is it is so vitally important that this truth be known, that you are prepared to carry it as far as you have to. And he would have kept the only he would have kept speaking. The only way they could stop his voice was to kill him. But he would never have taken his own life because at that moment, the need of it's like the, the force of the universe, the force of truth requires you to keep speaking and keep and and keep your volume up and i have to tell you when i was arrested uh a year later uh after a year after the invasion of iraq i was invested in uh, arrested on the patriot act i was the second non-arab american ever indicted i have to tell you that i knew that i had to pay that price i never regretted it i never for a minute doubted that I had done every single possible thing that I could do to try to stop this war, and that if that was the price that I had to pay, that I had to go to prison, I would pay that price, and that was just what had to happen. Susan, let's remind the listeners what they did to you. Um, and, and folks, Susan Linder never did anything other than the right thing in her job. She was a patriotic American, and she was conscientious in the work she did at the Iraqi embassy and the statements she made before 9-11 and the statements she made about Iraq afterwards. This woman never put a foot wrong. And they, they accused her of the most heinous thing that somebody like Susan could be accused of. They basically said that she was in cahoots with the Iraqi intelligence service and had taken money from them. And they didn't have a shred of evidence Ridiculous. at all. Ridiculous. <laughs> they didn't, they didn't have a shred of evidence. Now, what's it like for you, Susan? How does a woman like you cope with being thrown into the public glare like that all of a sudden fox cnn c-span you are enemy number one how do you deal with that i was i was i was astounded when i when i first well i'll tell you something the last words that my defense intelligence handler ever spoke to me uh and i did not know that i was never going to see him again but i remember vividly standing in the doorway of his apartment and him smiling at me and saying susan remember when they come to kill you scream your head off Jesus and Lord. i had, and and i'll tell you at the moment of my arrest when they were getting ready for me to do my perp walk my perpetrator walk is what they call it. They call it a perp walk in America. And they were getting ready to take me out in front of the media. I could, I heard his voice telling me what to do. Yeah. And he said, Susan, scream your head off. And so that's what I did. I said, I have ne- I, I am, I am an anti-war activist and I am innocent. I have never done anything to harm the United States security or security in the Middle East. And that just the Bush administration just was like, oh, you are not, you know, I was definitely the person who was going to just like uh, Dr. Kelly, who I have so much admiration for. If you were going to take me down, then I was going to go. If the Bush administration, the Pentagon, the Justice Department was going to take me down, I was going to go with a fight that was going to that, that it, I would it, it would be it would be a battle. And I would fight to the with my last breath. And I guarantee you that's what Dr. Kelly did too. You do not capitulate in that moment. You are fighting for your last minute of life. And that's what I did. And you would have had that genuine fear, wouldn't you? Because, it, you, because you just explained to us you were warned if they come to kill you. So again, you know, whether you're a man or a woman, it's got nothing to do with gender. Any human being in the world who is going to be locked up by people who are nasty let's be honest these are nasty people yeah they might be americans they might think they're doing their job but they're nasty people and you know that the the administration the intelligence services will do anything 
to prevent people like you speaking about what you know and what the truth is, you have to worry that they're going to come into your cell some night well, well, and make well, you look the, like you killed yourself. Oh, well, here's what they did to me. And this will this should scare you um, because this is when they the, the arrest itself was an ugly thing. But I immediately decided, see, see, the thing about a CIA asset is no matter. And this is they trained me very well. I was a covert operative. Now, the Iraqis and the Libyans, I also dealt with Libya. Um, I did the Lockerbie negotiations with Libya uh, as well, which we can talk about a different time. But the, the, Iraqi, the, the, the Iraqis always knew that I was a back channel. So they knew who I was from the very first meeting that I ever went in there. And it was only the Westerners, the British public, the American public, who did not know what I was doing. But the Arabs all knew. And this was approved by the CIA and the Pentagon. And it started in 1995. May of 1995, Libya was my first country, and you. And in 1995, nobody went to see talk to the Libyans without you know. This would be like North Korea today. Paranoid, isolated, deeply hostile, definitely sponsoring terrorism back in 1995, and unabashedly so, unapologetically so. So you did not go into these embassies as a as a casual thing. And I am trained, and I, I just have this character. And, and, and I have to say, I, I, use, I use the CIA, I played the CIA rules against the CIA. If you fight me, I'm going to fight you back. And I can turn on a dime. I can reconfigure my strategy in seconds. And so what they did was they arrested me. And then by the time I saw the indictment, I realized how stupid it was because they had – there was – I saw the desperation of it. There would be no way that they – I knew the first day – Within hours, there was no way they could ever take that case into court. And if they did take it into court, then I was going to use that to show that there was an Iraqi peace option. I was going to make the defense that there's no way that I could have been um, considered an Iraqi agent because I was persuading the Iraqis to give the Americans everything we wanted. That's and right. let me tell you, and let me tell you what that was. It went way beyond weapons inspections. The I also, and and I had documentation of this, um, uh, lots of documentation about this. The FBI, uh, Iraq agreed that an FBI task force could enter into Baghdad with authorization to conduct terrorism investigations, interview witnesses, and make arrests. This was before 9-11. This was six months before 9-11. This was in February and March of 2001, before 9-11. When I first told the Iraqis about the 9-11 threat in April and May of 2001, Six months before the attack occurs, Iraq's response was, well, we've already invited the FBI to come in. If you think there's going to be a terrorism attack and you think that there's somebody in Iraq who knows something about it, send the FBI. We'll help you. So they we, were they were cooperating s- even at their visas within, a, within days wow. and you can get over there and you can do this investigation. Come on in. Imagine that. They were basically bending over backwards. They were saying, um, you know, sure. you come in if you want. Come in. And of course, it was much extraordinary. And there are a lot of tweets now coming in here uh, and questions and really interesting comments as well. And I want to get to those. It's 29 minutes past uh, the hour. Susan Lindauer is on the show. Uh, it's great to have Susan on. Uh, she's an anti-war activist these days. Uh, you know that she's a, a former US congressional staffer. She's a former CIA asset. Uh, she worked at the Iraqi uh, embassy in DC, warned the government in the run-up to the uh, 9-11 attacks what was going to happen, uh, did everything she could to prevent a war in Iraq, worked with the Iraqis, uh, extraordinary woman, really. I'll mention again the book shortly, but I want to get to this. What's incredibly, what's incredibly important to remember is how you don't have a media in the United States, how you don't have a media in Britain that's working for the people. Because the pathetic US government, uh, with nothing really that they could keep Susan in prison for any longer, decided to say, ah, she's mentally incompetent, we can't, uh, 
we can't uh, bring her to trial. She's unfit for That's trial. That's right. Now, what's ludicrous That's about right. that is I'm a real journalist. The minute that happens, I'm all over that story. I'm thinking there's something very, very wrong here. They've tried to destroy this woman. Why have they done that? But, of course, the US media... Well, you know, we could be here all night talking about that. And um, you walked away. You, I remember you gave a terrific press conference at one stage where you talked about your time in the CIA. And I remember thinking way back, thinking, this woman is not really crazy, you know. Uh, I, you know I oh, think, listen, yeah. it was, they, were, they were absolutely desperate to stop me. Now realize, they are, first of all, they arrest me for treason. Think about the insanity of this. Of their on their part, not on my part, but on their part. First, they arrest me for treason, accusing me of help of standing with the Iraqis, of opposing the Bush administration in its genius war policy, and that I was such a moron that I did not support George Bush, and therefore I was a traitor because I did not support George Bush, and I was in collaboration with the Iraqis. Then they realize that there's no evidence to prove that. They've made up a story that they – and I'm saying to them, okay, you want to say that I received money from the Iraqi government? Very well. I demand a trial. I demand that you take that evidence, whatever evidence you're talking about, you show it to a jury, and I have the right to dispute your evidence Absolutely. in a court of law. And now, now you have a problem because there is no evidence. And they're like they kept saying, "Well, we'll show you the evidence." And, and I'm I'm not even kidding. I'm they they said to my attorney, "Well, we will show you the evidence um, seventy two hours before we go into trial. So you will have seventy two hours to look at the evidence as it's being presented to the court. But we will not give you access to evidence." prior to this and I was like that's garbage you can't do that I have every right to see the evidence and they said well actually no because the, and then they said well this is the Patriot Act it's the Patriot so Act yeah we yeah, do yeah. not and and this is very important for all those people who are sympathetic to Julian Assange or if you're on the fence and you're not sure here's what the Patriot Act means they also said that 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 evidence that would that, that, that they did not have to show all the evidence to me or my attorney because it, of the Patriot Act. So I, as a defendant, would not be allowed to know what evidence was against me, and my attorney would not be allowed to know what evidence was against me. And a jury would not be allowed to know what evidence was against me. And it remained a question mark. And we do, I, to this day, I don't know. Would they have to show the judge? But the real question, the, but then you have a problem. Because if you have uh, evidence that you're not allowed to see, how are you going to present a defense? Well, the answer is that the prosecutor has a double whammy against you because the prosecutor can say, well, since you don't know what the evidence is, we are not going to allow you to offer a defense Amazing. because you might suggest to the jury – something that isn't true because you, you might guess at what the evidence is and maybe it's something else and so you might try to prejudice the jury against this national security thing that we've got on you and uh so we're not going to allow you are now prohibited from knowing what the evidence is or from making a reasonable stab at providing a defense against what it might be. Susan, let me ask you this. Let it's me ask the you this. scariest thing in the world. It's the and scariest thing in the I world. I was locked in a military base when this was happening. And, of course, you were probably, you know, persona non grata there because of what you were accused of. You know what? And I, I, I want to turn now to Syria now in a minute. Loads of questions for you about Syria. But I'll ask you for a, for a brief answer to this so I can take a quick break. Then we'll come back and we'll probably have then only about 15 minutes left. It's flown by. Uh, the time is flying by. So I'll ask you this uh, quickly. Um, where were the great legal scholars of the Ivy League universities in America when this 
Patriot Act was rushed through and it had provisions in it like the ones you described where you can be tried in a secret court and you're not given uh, access to the evidence that they have against you so that you can discredit it or disqualify it. All the things you've just described there, Orwellian, horrible things. Where were the great legal men and women of US academia screaming from the rooftops about uh, you know, this sort of kangaroo court? Where were they? Well, I'll tell you something. Follow the case of Lynn Stewart. She was an attorney. What they did, they they made an example of her, and they arrested her and ordered her to go to prison for 10 years on the grounds that she allegedly violated the Patriot Act. There were a very few number of attorneys who had the guts to stand up to this because if they challenged the national security requirements – the classic, like, like, um, like one one of the other rules of the Patriot Act is that uh, the 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 attorney can file for security clearance to receive some of the evidence, but if the attorney reveals to the defendant what that evidence is, that attorney will be disbarred, sanctioned with financial penalties, and sent to prison. So you had most attorneys are then afraid to challenge the Patriot Act because they will go to jail. And and in a couple of cases, they have thrown people into jail. Look at Stanley Cohen's case, who's in prison right now, for challenging Israel. And Lynn Stewart, who was the attorney for the blind sheik. And, you know, she, oh, it, it's it's a tragedy. But they have thrown attorneys in jail for violating these these unconscionable restrictions on attorney-client communications. And if you weren't telling people, Susan, if you weren't telling people on the various radio programmes that you appear on, uh, people wouldn't know because the media doesn't tell them uh, these uh, vital stories. We're going to take a quick, a very quick break. Uh, it's only about 60 seconds. And then we're back with more from Susan Lindor. I'm delighted that Susan is on the programme. 24 minutes. In fact, it's 23 minutes to the top of the hour. Back with your questions for Susan after these. Have you lost access to important data from a computer hard drive, mobile phone, or other storage device? Maybe you have a broken hard drive containing years of information a smartphone that no longer works from which you'd like the pictures, movies and chats recovered. If you would like to recover data from any type of digital device, including desktop and laptop computers, external hard drives, cameras, smartphones, NAS and RAID servers, then contact Data Clinic today at dataclinic.co.uk now. Do you want to release the full potential of your soul consciousness and find out how to experience that power in all areas of your life now. Go to livingasyoursoul.com for free guidance with in-depth how-to articles, free healing meditations of creation recordings, free soul solutions, and much, much more. Livingasyoursoul.com Making the profound practical. You're listening to The Richie Allen Show in association with DavidIke.com. You are indeed also going out on alternatecurrentradio.com. Fab Radio 2, Fab Radio International in Manchester in England. Our guest is Susan Lindauer. Delighted that she's on the programme. Her book, Extreme Prejudice, The Terrifying Story of the Patriot Act and the Cover-Ups of 9-11 and Iraq is fantastic. Colin is listening to the programme on the Costa del Sol in Spain. Said he was lent the book recently read it, it was brilliant, it was fascinating but it was terrifying, said Colin I want to say to Sean McDonald as well Sean asked a really good question about does Susan ever think the real uh, culprits of 9-11 will ever face the music we'll get to that just before we finish Sean, because that is a good question but I want to turn now uh, for the time being anyway, the time we have left to Syria, Richard Mace how you doing Richard? Richie, I'm not sure if Susan can answer this But was there ever any real evidence that could justify any action against Bashar al-Assad? Susan. Uh, No, that was all orchestrated by Hillary Clinton and Ambassador Robert Ford, who went around the city to uh, when 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 Syria was very quiet 
before any of the rebellions started, before the Arab Spring and the demonstrations. And he visited all the, the rebel leaders and said, we'll back you if you will overthrow Assad. Uh, there was no justification for this. I'm very – a lot of people get upset with me for saying this. There's no justification for it at all. Um, President Assad is not his father. He was educated to be a, a doctor in 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 London, of ophthalmologist in London. Uh, he opened up the internet. He let the opened up the doors of the prisons and let every all the activists out. He he had a much more modern cosmopolitan society. And you see what we've done. It's a disaster. It's a disaster. You know, I was speaking to um, guests on the program this week about the French foreign. Minister, excuse me, the, the retired French Foreign Minister, Roland. My, you know, my partner is French, Susan, and she'll kill me. My pronunciations are disgraceful. Uh, so it's uh, Roland du, uh, Dumas. Uh, he was French Foreign Minister under Mitterrand. Uh, you'll know this, of course. He was speaking um, to French television a couple of years ago, and he said that he was in London in 2009, and intelligence agents in London were telling him that they were planning on starting something in Syria, and that was back in 2009, uh, two years before the alleged uprising there. How frustrating is it for somebody with your experience to see the same crazy, maniacal, murdering lawyers doing the same thing country to country to country? How do you cope with that? Horrifying. Libya, another example, a prosperous, stable, secular nation. So was Syria, prosperous, stable, secular. And yet you leave Jordan. Jordan's a monarchy. They don't have any elections at any time. And uh, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, uh, Kuwait, none of those countries that are monarchies are facing any kind of challenge. Why are we going after uh, countries that are, are secular? You know, this it's just it's just ridiculous. You know, you know, the- um, you know my opinion on this, and I've held it for a long time. You know, I believe, and I think you probably have come to believe it. And I mean, you know so much more than I do about diplomacy and about international geopolitics. You really do, uh, and maybe it was difficult for you to come to this conclusion, but. It's deliberate, the destabilisation of the region, the driving out of thousands and thousands of refugees into other countries to overwhelm those countries is deliberate. And of course, it's probably no... Uh, it's probably no Absolutely, coincidence. Absolutely, it's deliberate. Yeah, and it? it's and I ke- I have said so many times, why are you so st- why it, 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 it's it's too easy to say that they're stupid. The the problem that the ultimate problem is that the war machine needs desperately needs conflict in order to generate profits for itself. And really that's what it comes down to. They are like a, they're a junkie for cash. For, for, they're like a junkie out to get their drug. And whatever they destroy in the process, it doesn't matter. If they destroy the middle class, then they still have their profits for their bombs and their guns and their, their munitions, their tanks, their weapons. Their, the United States has, has used up all of its weapons, and now they need a huge investment. They're talking about a $545 billion dollars to just re re outfit the Pentagon so that they can keep fighting at the level that they're fighting. How about if we stop fighting? How about if we if we turn that? Imagine what you could do with five hundred and forty five billion dollars. You it. could have you could have an extraordinary peacetime economy. We could convert the U.S. back to a manufacturing base. We could strengthen education. We could have free health care like the rest of the world. There's so many good positive things we can do if we stop financing the military. And at, at that level, we don't need it. It's not necessary. And you know what's interesting, Susan? What you've described is absolutely right. And I suppose most Americans don't think when the, when Bush or when, of course, these days it's Obama, another war criminal. When Obama says, "Well, you know what?" They're the same. They're the they're same all, people. This aren't is they? the problem. The this is people. the problem. We have, you know, we have two two side one coin with two different faces on it, and it's just you know heads heads or tails, but it's the same coin and it's the same mission. And I I am very proud of Obama on Iran. The, I think the Iran peace deal is outstanding. I'm a huge supporter of this. I feel like Obama has finally learned, perhaps too late, 
but at least we've stopped the war, any war with Iran. I also am very proud, delighted, very happy with Putin and Russia's involvement in Syria. Um, I think that Russia, there's no way that uh, Syria could take this on itself. I believe that Angela Merkel invited the refugees into Europe because she was deliberately courting a NATO intervention in Syria. And she was trying to create momentum to say, here we have a European problem. Now the refugees, we have to stand with these refugees in ousting Assad. And immediately, with blitzkrieg speed, lightning speed, President Putin moved uh, his, Russian mil- his Russian military en masse in a, from September 4th to September 24th. And if you look at this, these two things dovetail exactly. And Putin, there's no, we're going to do this over six months. They did it in a three-week period. Wow. Imagine Very it. impressive. Imagine and, it when you and think now, back. Yeah. And now we see that Putin has stopped NATO. And, and I, you know, a lot of you may say, well, how can you be against the war in Syria and then say that Russia should be in there bombing those poor people? It's horrible. But... His Russia's presence in Syria has stopped NATO cold from going in there, and that is the best thing for Europe. You will, Britain and Europe would never survive financially. You would go into the tank, into but Susan depression if you ever go into war in Syria it must not happen isn't that what's meant to happen though we, we what the the crazy agenda and a lot of people are waking up to this who previously thought this was silly conspiracy theory what the agenda wants to do is absolutely break these countries all of our countries move us further and further to a cashless society to a no cash agenda i mean look at the countries they've gone after they've gone after countries that had no rothschild controlled bank that weren't in debt to anybody didn't owe anybody any money uh, low unemployment in a lot of these countries wealthy countries because they had their oil and their gas you know no coincidence that they've done that they want to sell out all these countries to through putting their puppet dictators in there uh, but to, it's going to be disastrous. It is, but it's meant it's, to be, no? But the thing, no, well, well, but but the thing is, again, we have very stupid people right now. It is still a very stupid policy right now. Saudi Arabia, I'm sure you are, your listeners know, has between a hundred. I've heard different figures: a hundred and fifty thousand to three hundred and fifty thousand soldiers amassed from all over the all over the Middle East, uh, all over the Sunni Middle East. That's right, and Malaysia. Asia and, and Northern Africa, and they are amassing in the, the, the desert of Saudi Arabia for war games right on the Syrian border. Now, this is supposed to start in April, I believe. I guess it's the end of March or beginning of April. Well, you, you don't put 150,000 soldiers into the desert of Saudi Arabia without or, or higher, up to 350,000, unless you're expecting to maybe try to instigate some pressure and some troubles that maybe there would be a justification for going into Syria and for intervening. And so, again, we have to be pretty grateful that Russia is there to fight this for us because the United States can never go back into the Middle East, thank God, and neither can Europe. And Russia's presence there, I be, oh, please, God, I hope I'm right. I hope I'm right. Russia's presence there prohibits NATO action because NATO cannot risk a confrontation with Russia. I hope so you're right. I, don't think, I think that I, I think that, right. that Rus- I think that Putin has actually saved us from an for now for now from an even worse conflict. But stop and think: How high are your oil prices? in Europe and, and Britain. I don't know. Here in the United States, they're very low. Yeah, rock bottom What's, at the moment, yeah, rock bottom. Okay, yeah. well, but, but, he, but once Saudi Arabia goes into conflict, and if there's a war in, engulfing Saudi Arabia and Qatar and Bahrain and all the major oil suppliers that have not been targeted, like isn't it interesting that Saudi Arabia has targeted everybody else so that they would be the only one, you, everybody'd have to buy their oil. But look what happened. Syria's oil was destroyed. Libya's oil is destroyed. Now the United States has just launched a flight's in, air, air attack airstrikes 
on Libya because just in the past week or two in Libya because they're desperately afraid that Libya's oil will oil supply will be taken over by ISIS. And so they're fighting now to, to free the oil facilities in Libya from ISIS control. So now you have a completely different dynamic. The people that we consider the, quote, bad guys are now controlling the oil supplies. Well, what's going to happen to Saudi Arabia? That's going to be – if this goes into a full conflagration, Turkey thought that you know, all these fools who think they're immune to the violence – once you start playing these games, you're going. You're going straight into. It's like a mag. It's like a propulsion. It's like a, a an undertow. It's like a a, a violent undertow that's just going to suck you in until you're there, and you can't get out of it. Turkey's Turkey's in this war. They just don't know it yet, and and it's not going to be favor. You know. If if anybody wants to go uh, see uh, what is it Santa Sofia, uh, the the beautiful the beautiful chapel the uh, uh, cathedrals uh in in turkey go see them now because they won't be there in 10 years the the turkey's going to become so bloody dangerous that it will be impossible to travel that break i you know i'm really mad at turkey i'm very angry at at the president of turkey for getting into this conflict but the whole society is going to be destroyed and that is heartbreaking every you know this the destruction of syria the destruction of libya europe with the refugee crisis and i sympathize with real refugees who are trying to escape the violence but huh, it's destabilizing europe it is you and in, are, in you're at a point you are at a point where there could be a war in europe Absolutely. And within those refugees, of course, you do have bad guys. And, and, and of course, I would suggest again that uh, this is part of the plan. Susan, would you believe it for now? That's been the quickest 40 minutes that um, we've ever done, I think, on the programme. It's absolutely flown by. For now, we're going to have to leave it there, but I'll, I'll be inviting you back real soon. If you want to come back, we might do a longer. I'd love to come back. It'll be great I'd to have you back. We'll do a longer stint. But just before you go, in the 60 seconds that we have left, um, do address Simon's question, uh, Sean's question, because it is very uh, pertinent, of course. Do you ever see a time in the future when those... Donald Trump. Donald Trump, as Donald Trump has offer, who is running for president of the United States, has agreed to open a 9-11 investigation and he's going to look at Building 7. If he's elected, um, I will tell you that is, as, as shocking as that may be to the rest of you that Donald Trump might get elected, there is so much fury against the Washington establishment, which is positive if it's harnessed correctly. If it's harnessed for good, then we can do something positive. But uh, he has promised that he will have an inve- a, a real 9-11 investigation. He's talking about the fact that we knew about 9-11 and there are no sacred cows with Donald Trump. Uh, I will tell you that you, I, I think Europe needs to brace itself that he, it looks very convincing that Donald Trump will be the Republican nominee. And Hillary Clinton is largely hated here. So the Democrats do not have a strong candidate yet. They have Bernie Sanders, but Donald Trump, he may be the president. I don't, I don't need, do you know what? On that note, we'll leave it for now, right? I want to thank you again for coming on uh, the show. I, I'm going to tweet out the link to where people can buy uh, your outstanding book, Susan. Really enjoyed your thank company. You. Your insight is brilliant. Thanks for doing it. Stay in touch and come back on the show again in a month or so, and we'll do a longer chat. Lovely to speak with you. I would love to. Thank you. Have a great day. You too, Susan. Bye for now. The lovely Susan Lindauer on the line to us from Maryland, uh, just outside Washington, D.C. 